the cave we're live and i appear to be alone but i'm not <laughs> actually i'll move across a little you can move across a tiny bit okay we're supposed to have um let me bring up i'll, I'll put this um frame on here here we go no i won't do that cut your mouth out <laughs> We're supposed to have, well, first Sunday of the month, we normally have both Dave Baldwin and uh, Tom Toby with us. But Tom is uh, in Iraq at the moment. Uh, he's been in England doing an exhibition there and then been trying to contact him, haven't had any contact, uh, emailed him again with the link for today's broadcast and said, you know, Join us if you can, please. And we got a message from his dear wife saying he's en route to Iraq at the moment for the Abe'in uh, pilgrimage to Kabbalah, uh, which many of you will be familiar with as the uh, preeminent um, Hajj for uh, the pilgrimage for uh, Shia Muslims. Well, not, not that uh, going to Mecca isn't important as well, but going to Kabbalah and uh, remembering the martyrdom of Imam Hussein is uh, also a very significant pilgrimage. And there's a lot more people going to it than the um, Hashim Mecca too. But um, anyway, he's done that a number of times. He's published a book about it with photos that he's taken on the trip, an amazing thing. I've been invited myself, maybe one day I'll go. But at the moment, that's where Tom is. As to our dear friend Dave, he's just been on the phone to me. And um, they've got an internet outage. So I've, I've spent the last 10 minutes trying to talk him through how to access, how to use his phone as the Wi-Fi source. And then we eventually worked out his phone doesn't have internet access either. <laughs> so there you go. So it's just me and Fran. And I'm sure uh, oh, we've got a few people have chimed in with some comments here. Uh, Rob Gillen is saying hello. Hello to you, brother. And a happy Father's Day to you, Rob. And hello to Karen and a happy Father's Day to you, Karen. Thank you for the greetings. Much appreciated. Now, I was going to show off my Father's Day. Um, oh, Phil Fantasi is here with us as well. Happy Father's Day to you, brother. I'm going to show off my um, Father's Day card here which is um courtesy of fran i won't show you the, i won't show you the inside because it's personal and lovely but the outside has a picture uh, of all my favorite people on it so you'll see batman at the top there is it you know, see there he is yeah batman and down the bottom indiana jones that reflects the fact that Fran and I went and saw the latest Indiana Jones movie. Have we seen all of them? Mm -hmm. I don't think we ever watched that one with the... I remember we watched the first couple. Anyway, we've seen all, you've seen all of them. Yeah, okay. We saw the last one together. It was good. Quite good. What was the other one we saw together recently? I don't remember. Oh, we've just been watching 24 together. We've, we've, we're through three series of... 24 now there's another image of fatherhood which is um, so happy father's day to um what, what's what's karen said there love the card friend thank you karen it's a great card um and it came with some great gifts as well i haven't got any of the gifts with me but there's like a bag full of them so um we got a, a, a coffee cup with batman on it which I've been sipping coffee in on the way here this morning. We have a wallet, and it's a Batman wallet. Forget the old bloody wallet. No, rubbish compared to this one. And there's um, some socks, Indiana Jones socks, ready to go hiking out in the in the in the wilderness. And um, what was the other one? Um, there was four things i'm sure okay no the coffee mug yeah. yeah sorry there's a travel mug and a coffee mug like a standard ceramic coffee mug and they're both batman mugs and then the, the your the 
travel one is Star Wars. You're right. Sorry, the travel one is Star Wars. There you go. So uh, everything is covered. All my favorite things. Bringing out my inner Jedi and my inner bat. Um, I've got both Star Wars and um, and Joy is with us. <laughs> yes, peace indeed. So there you go. We've got. Um, we were expecting this morning to have both. Um, Dave and possibly Tom, and neither are here, but Fran is here. <laughs> so um, I don't know how, like we normally do a Bible discussion. I don't know how much you want to discuss, but we'll see how we go, eh? Okay. 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 Look, I've got my one of my favourite hymns for us to begin with today. So why don't we do that? Um, for all the saints who from their labours rest. It's um, an old favourite, and it's the song I once sung at my funeral. Just taking note of that. At your funeral? Yeah. I'm not saying it's necessarily coming any day, but just so you know. Oh, you want it sung? Yes. Oh. That's my, the one I once sung at my funeral. And I guess Father's Day, I'm thinking of my dad, who died in March 2001. Seems like yesterday. But... Um, I think we sung this at his funeral. If not, whenever I do sing it, I think of him. And I'm sure you can think of those of you who have lost dads or granddads or all the great saints who from their labours rest. We can think of them as we sing. This this version is a little bit fast. It was sung at some huge British festival, but it's a beautiful hymn nonetheless. Do join with me. Our first reading is from the book of Exodus, chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. Where's my phone gone? I need the light to get my eyes are dimming. Now, Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in the flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I'll go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over uh, to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals. For the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I'm the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. At this Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. God said, I've indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard them crying and because of their slave drivers, crying out because of their slave drivers, and I'm concerned about their suffering. So I've come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up to a land, into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hittites and Jebusites, Hivites and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I've seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. 
But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign that uh, it is I that sent you. When you brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What then will I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. That is what you will say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A powerful passage. Now, Dave is back with us. We're going to just see. My fingers are crossed. Can we hear you, brother? Hello, hello, hello. Oh, thanks be to really? God. Really? Listen, really? Yes. Oh, okay. Yes, good. yes, yes, yes. Okay. Very good okay. to have, have you in <laughs> word as well as in. Uh, Rob's good suggestion, was it? that, Or rather, Phil's restarting the computer worked? Yeah, it might have been that because I did that, but I think maybe our our, our outage period has finished anyway. Um, no, I yeah. think we're back on with full power. I think. I hope. I All right. They, look, fingers. they're here, my friend. Um, Moses and the burning bush. Yes. You burned, but it was consumeth not. I um, mean, that's the. It's the. Gosh, who's got that as their symbol? Is it the Salvation Army? The burning bush symbol. Um, um, yes, I'm not sure about that. No, the Salvation Army, is it? Blood and fire. Yeah. I yeah. have a feeling that, that there's a symbol of the burning bush in there somewhere. Look, I could be wrong, but it's a powerful image. It's unique too in, in the uh, in the Bible, I think, isn't it? It's, uh, yeah. You don't often hear God calling out of bushes, and it's not obvious why, but the whole encounter with God here is deeply mysterious including the name of God, I am. Yeah. I am. Um, you know, th there's no simple name for God, even though the, the name which, well, the whole history of the name of God is a difficult one, isn't it? Because I, I know our uh, Jehovah's Witnesses friends say, you know, we've got to get the name right and that it's Jehovah. And it's whatever the name given to the people of Israel that um, it we, we have it in those four letters, which in English I think are Y W W H, isn't it, or H W? Yeah. 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 I mean, the problem we have is the name of God revealed, which we often use the word Yahweh. We we can't be a hundred percent sure because it because you don't use the name of the Lord your God in vain. Therefore. Um, the people of Israel never included the, the vowel markers when they used the name of God. They never included the consonants. So that's why we have the consonants, the Y, the W, the... Ah, um, so we don't do the whole name. No, but if you combine the consonants, which we do have, with the vowels of Elohim, the word for Lord in Hebrew, you get Jehovah. Right, okay. But it's almost certain that those weren't the vowels. So the irony is, I think... Uh, no offence intended to our Jehovah's Witnesses, sisters and brothers, but it, it certain, almost certainly wasn't the combination of the vowels for Lord and the le the consonants the, the, of the name revealed. Anyway, at this point, the name <laughs> revealed, it's it just I am. So the name of God is always a mystery. You don't take the name of the Lord your God in vain, and yet the name, we, we don't know it. And here as it's given to us, it's simply the mysterious I am. Right. Or I will be, it can be translated too. I will yeah, be. But, but when we're exhorted not to take the name of the Lord in vain, I mean, do you think of I am? Because I don't think of I am, you know. I think of, of Jesus or Jesus Christ. Well, Jesus, of course, says before Abraham was, I am, doesn't he? You know, um, yes. Jesus takes that. There's the three statements in John's gospel where Jesus owns this very name, yeah. The, the, yeah. the I am, again, pointing to God in this with this original mysterious designation God is who God is, or God will be who God will be. 
I think it's often suggested the better translation, which suggests in this context that God is known through what God does. That, you know, in the context here in Egypt, that it's going to be the Exodus, which shows you who God is. God is the one who releases people from their suffering, who lets the captives go free, who sees the oppression of his people. He hears their cries and acts right. with mercy. You know, God, who, who, who is God? God is who God will be. You know, God will, God is who God is. And you know who God is through the acts of God. Right. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, that's, that's true to the scriptures as a whole, particularly to the Torah. Um, but do you do you find meaning in in that in terms of taking the name of the Lord in vain? Is that the path you go down to take the Lord's name in vain? It's a very good point, isn't it? I mean, I think particularly from a Middle Eastern cultural perspective, names carry a sense of the person and their character. And I often think of that line in, in Lawrence of Arabia where they, they ask him, what is your name? And he says, my name is for my friends. Uh, that knowing the name of someone implies a personal relationship with someone. And yes. we, we see the names different people take on. I mean, even in the narratives we've been looking at, when Abram becomes Abraham, when Sarai becomes Sarah, you know, that the changing of the name is about a changing of vocation. It's... it's uh, it, it ties into who they are and their own personal history. Right. And so the name of God, praise the name of the Lord, is not simply about what a wonderful name that is with its very special vowels and consonants. It's a, it's about who God is. You know, it's, it's similar to the concept of praise. You know, you praise the name of the Lord. I th my understanding is that praise means recount the great deeds of God. So it's again, it's a looking back. Praising is recounting history and seeing what God does. And I don't think you can separate the praise of God from the name of God, from the history of God. In other words, God is who God is. God is what God does. Oh, we saw that one. It was Shane. We didn't see there. Thank you, Shane. I hope that was a thumbs up to what I just said, and no, I don't think it actually came in. Of early. course it was. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, ra I'm, I'm raving a bit, but look, it's a very mysterious encounter, this one. But the key thing, of course, is God's heard the cries of the people who are suffering, and he's yes. going to do something about it. Yeah, yeah. This, this, yeah. This is the <laughs> beginning of the growing of our concept of what salvation is all about. Yeah. Yeah. Shows us archetypally in the the freedom of the slaves coming into the promised land. Right, right. Uh, I I'm yeah. I can't remember at the moment. What what's what has Moses's relationship with God been like before this? I don't think was we there any. any? Idea. No, we don't have any idea. Uh, is it before or after this that he kills the Egyptian slave master? Uh, that there's there's the there's the point. I, I, can, yeah, I should know, shouldn't I? Whether whether it's before or after. Yes, I can't remember either. But, but at some point, we do see Moses start to identify with his people. Yes. Even though he's yeah. been brought up as an Egyptian prince, he yeah. recognizes from early on. I mean, his mother's brought him up. I think his mum's told him what's really going on, and he starts yeah. to identify. Yeah with the the oppressed even though he is technically one of the oppressors or part of that group yes but he he's left the royal him. family at this at this point hasn't he well he runs when he kills that um uh guy who he sees beating a slave yeah he yeah. has to take off and yeah. so yeah he's, he's yeah so that must have happened earlier yeah so he's now working for his father-in-law jethro the priest of Midian. Yes. Yeah. Yes, Modi, Moses flees to Midian. That happened in chapter two. So, yeah, look, he's he's already started to identify not as the family of his upbringing, but the the uh, but with the oppressed people, right? The slaves right. in Egypt. Yes, and the relationship is to grow.
Yes, and you're right. And he, with the priest of Midian, no doubt he started to build a connection with the God Get of his, understanding. Of his yeah. forefathers. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? You can't, I don't know if you can, you can look at this and examine it from a sort of Christian post Jesus Christ point of view, you know, when, you know, because God says he's going to bring them into the, uh, this land, um, which is now the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the yes. Perizzites, etc. Yes, it's very um, explicit, isn't it? Yeah. Somebody which, else's which land. You'll be wiping out um, so that you can take well, over this land of milk and honey. Or, or yeah. yeah, but somehow, you know, it's going to become the land of the uh, of God's people. Yes, yes. So, I mean, it doesn't say there whether they're going to be getting rid of the other inhabitants or just joining joining with them. I mean, it's not clear at this point, is it? It becomes clear. Yeah. But, yeah. Bottom line is there's a beautiful future promise to these people who are suffering. Yeah. yeah. And I get the feeling that the name of God, I am who I am, I will be who I will be, is tied in with that act of liberation which is going to happen for these people yeah i think yeah that's a fair point yes mm. anything you want to add my girl no <laughs> <laughs> hi fran hi you've seen the cartoon of what moses uh, what's it called what's the, what's the disney version called prince of egypt prince of egypt thank you haven't seen it okay we're gonna to have to watch it we're going to put it now put it in our watch list well you've read the book yeah yes. <laughs> all right my friend we've got we've got a 20 minute homily from our friend stephen size of the day so i think we should move into that he he gives us the reading from romans so i'm gonna pass to him and uh, we'll come back afterwards with the gospel okay our epistle today is taken from uh, Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 12, beginning to read at verse 9 to 21. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honour one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervour serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. My favourite hotel in all the world is in Bethlehem, the Waldorf, spelt W-A-L-L-E-D, off. Designed by Banksy, the anonymous British artist, it overlooks the separation wall. In bricks and mortar, Banksy demonstrates how art can become an act of defiance against Israeli settler colonialism and apartheid. Tuesday this week, 29th of August, was the anniversary of the assassination of Naji al-Ali, the Palestinian political cartoonist 
and writer who drew the iconic image of the ten-year-old child Handala, meant to represent himself. You'll find it drawn on the apartheid war in many places dividing the illegal Israeli colonies from the Palestinian ghettos. Appropriately, therefore, this week's Kumi Now from Sabil is entitled Art as Resistance. Too often, they say, the Palestinian tragedy is portrayed as a humanitarian crisis rather than one that has to do with identity and self-determination. They believe that art is a luxury that Palestinians cannot afford. That instead, what they need is bread to eat, to fill their stomachs, so they can think and live another day. But people shall not live by bread alone, Matthew 4.4. 4. Art and culture instead feed the soul and allow it to thrive. It gives people the strength to refuse being on the receiving end, perceived as victims. It allows people to become actors instead of spectators. It gives them the long breath necessary to resist. For wherever there is occupation, there will be resistance. The question, therefore, is not whether to resist, but how to resist. That is what I'd like us to reflect on briefly now as we resist evil. And we're going to find the answers in our epistle reading from Romans 12, 9 to 21. And I've picked out four ways that we can resist evil. First, prayer. Verse 12 says, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. What does it mean to be faithful in prayer? What does it mean to be faithful to a partner, to a friend or anyone? In the marriage service, we promise to be committed for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health. I think that's what it means to be faithful. Faithful to a person, faithful to God in prayer. It means sharing everything with God, the highs and the lows. In Paul's letter to Timothy, uh, chapter 2 verse 1, he instructs us in particular, pray for kings and all others who are in authority that we may live a quiet and peaceful life. So in our prayers we need to pray for our leaders, the leaders who serve us, who bring law and order, peace and security, and if they don't we need to pray that they will. Notice the benefits of praying for our leaders. God's will is that we enjoy quiet and peaceful lives. So we're to pray for our leaders. But Jesus says we must pray for our enemies. Pray for those who hurt you and persecute you. Matthew 5.44 So we should pray for the Israeli Prime Minister, for the fascist Israeli government. We should pray for the senior commanders in the Israeli military. Pray that God brings them to repentance. Pray for our Western leaders who defend them. Shame them, Lord. Pray for the United Nations. Pray for the International Court of Justice that they will have the courage to investigate the war crimes being committed every day in Palestine. Pray for the leaders of our church, for Sabeel, for Kairos. We resist evil first by prayer because we serve a God of justice. We resist evil by praying even for our enemies that they will be repent and turn from their evil. This is how we bless our enemies, how we bless those who persecute us, verse 14. So pray. Secondly, we are to trust God. Verse 19, do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. You have God's word on that. God will repay, because God is a God of justice. That's why we must trust the God of justice to bring justice. But trusting God is not intended to lead to resignation or passivity. 
because the Apostle Paul instructed us in the letter to the Philippians, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one in the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign that they will be destroyed and that you will be saved and that by God. You see that expression, whatever happens, irrespective of your circumstances, trust God to guide you, to motivate you, to give you wisdom, to use you to resist evil. Together with other believers through united collective action. That's why collective action is so powerful, because when we work together, we encourage one another. We give courage and strength. That's why I'm delighted to be involved with a team of colleagues around the world planning the 2024 International Seville Conference, which will be held next November. We'll be resisting evil by challenging apartheid and religious extremism, whether it's anti-Semitism, Islamophobia or Christophobia. We trust God to inspire us, to give us wisdom and use our collective action to resist evil. So we pray and we trust God. Thirdly, we are to live at peace. Verse 18. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Notice again, Paul says, if it is possible. You see, the Bible is both realistic and practical here. As far as it depends on you means as far as it's possible for you, live at peace with everybody. But the verse is therefore acknowledging the fact that sometimes it's not possible to live at peace with some people. Have you ever met somebody, uh, no matter how hard you try, they could not or would not be appeased or reconciled? In that case, you just have to let them go. Recently, someone who claims to be a Christian published an article about me, alleging that I try to divert church funds to Hamas in Gaza. It's completely untrue. It's defamatory. But I, I took uh, advice and I went to my church leaders and they signed statements denying the allegation. So I sent the copies to the author and asked him to withdraw his article. But he refused. It's still online. I want to live at peace with the guy and I continue to pray for him. So the Bible says, if it is possible. Sometimes, and maybe right now for you, it's not possible. If somebody abused your partner, your children, you wouldn't be at peace with them. If they stole your property or demolished your home, God wouldn't expect you to be at peace with them. If it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace. What does that little expression mean, live at peace? It means that peace, not fear, peace, not resentment, peace, not anger, should be our default position, our default response when peace is absent. I check my blood pressure most days and uh, you're expected to uh, uh, check your blood pressure when you're resting. They want to know what your blood pressure is like when you're not doing anything. Because if it's high then, it's going to be very high when you're exercising, you're stressed. That to me is what it means to live at peace. To be at peace when you're resting. Psalm 34, 14 says, seek peace and pursue it. We seek peace because often there is no peace and we pursue it tenaciously. We must seek peace with God first, then with ourselves, then perhaps our partner, then our children, our family, work colleagues, in our church, in our community, and above all with our enemies. So pray, trust God, seek peace. And the fourth advice we receive is to overcome evil with good. Verse 20, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing so, you'll heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. 
So how do we overcome evil? By constructive, proactive, redemptive, non-violent action. Civil disobedience, if we uh, reject what's happening around us. Boycotts, divestments and sanctions. Sabeel is part of the Kairos movement, which brings church leaders and Christians together from around the world. The Kairos Palestine document says this about resistance. We say that our option as Christians in the face of Israeli occupation is to resist. Resistance is a right and a duty for Christians. But it is a resistance with love as its logic. It is thus a creative resistance for it must find human ways to engage the humanity of the enemy. So we seek peace with our enemies not only by praying for them but by seeking to bless them, by loving them, by seeking their best interests because this is the only way we will ever win them and be reconciled. So resistance is not only a right and a duty but a constructive way to love our enemies. No wonder uh, Zionists are desperate to, for governments to ban BDS because they know that non-violence is a powerful and just weapon. They know that if non-violent resistance brought an end to apartheid in South Africa, it could bring an end to apartheid in Palestine. So I'm committed to defeating apartheid because I care for the souls of Jewish Israelis as much as I care for the rights of my Palestinian sisters and brothers. Zionism manifested in apartheid is destroying the soul of Jewish people just as much as it's destroying the future of Palestinians. And if opposing racism leads to spurious accusations of anti-Semitism, so be it. So be it. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, they will be called children of God. I really don't care what Zionists call me or even what the Church of England thinks, me, thinks of me. I only care what God calls me. That's why I want to be a peacemaker, not a widow maker. I want to live my life in such a way that Satan wakes up in the morning and cries out, oh no, here comes Caesar, here comes Sabeel, here comes Kairos. Don't you? Then take these four ways to heart. Four ways we can resist evil based on Romans chapter 12. Pray, trust God, seek peace and resist evil. Four ways we can overcome evil with good. I wonder if you remember uh, the film High Noon starring Gary Cooper. Gary Cooper is a sheriff of a small town in the Wild West. A gang of four outlaw brothers had earlier terrorised the town. The sheriff had brought them to justice and sent them to prison. But in prison, they vowed that they would, when they got out, they would kill the sheriff. The film focuses on one particular day. The sheriff has just married the beautiful Grace Kelly. She happens to be a, a, a devout Quaker, utterly opposed to all violence. So the sheriff resigns from law enforcement and the couple are about to leave town on their honeymoon. He's going to start a new life as a rancher. But suddenly, word comes that the outlaw brothers have been released from prison. They're due to arrive that very day on the noon train. Everybody urges the couple to get out of town quickly. They ride away, but the sheriff is troubled. Finally, he turns the wagon round and heads back to town, much to the consternation of his bride. He cannot run away from his old enemies. He pins the badge back on his shirt. He tries to round up a posse, but it's Sunday morning and everyone is in church. So the sheriff interrupts the service. He explains the emergency and he asks the men of the congregation to help him form an a posse. Several people stand up and respond. One of them says, we'd like to help you, sheriff, but we're not trained gunmen. That's what we hire sheriffs for. Another says, 
You know, Sheriff, we Christians don't believe in violence. Still another says, Sheriff, you're a brave man, but it would probably have been wiser if you'd not come back to town. The sheriff turns and walks out in disgust. In the background, you can hear Tex Ritter singing the theme song. I do not know what fate awaits me. I only know I must be brave. And I must face the man who hates me or lie a coward, a craven coward, or lie a coward in my grave. In case you haven't seen the movie, I'm not going to tell you how it turns out. But I can tell you how history will turn out because I've read the book. You know what the world will be like when Christ returns? We're told about it in the book of Revelation, chapters 21 and 22. It says 21.4, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. And in Revelation 22, we're given this beautiful picture of the New Jerusalem. We're told there'll be a river of the water of life as clear as crystal flowing down from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. This is my vision of the future. There will ultimately be healing among the nations and this should be our motivation in the present, knowing that our labour, however costly and painful, will not be in vain. If it is possible, therefore, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. We'll stand for the gospel. The Holy Gospel is written in the 16th chapter. The gospel points in Matthew, beginning at the 21st verse. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders chief priests and teachers of the law, that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said. This will never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Whoever wants to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for me will find it. What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world and yet forfeits his soul? Or what can a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is coming, is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels. And he will reward each person according to what he has done. And I tell you the truth, some of you who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to bring back Dave. Good to have you with us, brother, again. Um, good word from Stephen. I'm not sure Great how connected to the gospel yeah. reading. Yeah. Um, as I say, in, if, in this gospel reading, if this is our journey through Matthew, this is the part of the journey where we get mugged. You know, it's a, it's a bit of a shock. I yeah, think Peter, Peter must coming, have felt that he got mugged at this point. Yes. Well, particularly coming in the heels of Peter's confession last week you are the christ the son of the living god and peter gets affirmed for this yes peter you're the rock you know 
you know, you've learned this directly from a father in heaven and you're the rock upon which I'm going to build the church and now you're Satan. Um, any insights, brother? Well, I mean, obviously he, you know, he got part of it right, didn't he? You know, he did get part of it right. I mean, Jesus does affirm him, you know, in a huge way um yeah. with, with what he what he says initially but then you know it's a two-part response and the second part is is wrong because like all the rest of um you know the um of god's people i mean he's he, he is expecting jesus to to lead the people um as the king as the expected messiah has been talked about in the prophets and and through scripture throughout time um to you know to a to a to a to a situation which includes um most people would expect um you know the uh, the ejection of the romans the the occupying force from uh, from their country but yeah. um of course he and the others just couldn't see um that 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 wasn't the way and no wonder no wonder who was you know who was expecting that um the the great suffering that had been talked about throughout scripture that you know would have to come um before the you know when the messiah came or or you know um that that um that the great suffering would be would be for for jesus um you know that he would die on a cross yeah the, the whole agenda of jesus seems to be just completely at odds with the expectations of his peers yeah um that in itself is disturbing, isn't it? Because as I say, it reflects how wrong we can get God while at the same time getting God completely right. As yeah. It's, <laughs> so, you know, Peter manages to be both completely right and completely wrong at the same time. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he sees in Jesus the saviour of the world correctly. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Got completely wrong as to how that's going to happen. But, I mean, who could have got it right um yeah who could who could have got it right no one could have got, got it right could they no um, we, we think about the only the only um insight we get into how jesus interpreted his own god-given mission is how he takes up the servant songs and isaiah as being an understanding of messiahship you know he was wounded for their transgressions and okay doesn't quote that bit particularly but the idea that the suffering servant represents uh, the uh, uh, format for for, for the uh, role of messiahship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it had never I don't been. Know, were there any peers of his at the time who, who who made that connection, or was it just Jesus? Because no, well, no one. I don't think anyone did make. You know, no one. Uh, they tried to make sense at times out of this uh, this idea of you know of of the great suffering, and perhaps it was going to be the suffering of the uh, the actual nation, all the people themselves. You know, I think there's, or I think there's is is there is there in the book of Maccabees um, something about this? Um, you know, the the you know trying to identify what the suffering is um, and um, and I, I think the idea is that, that it, is, it is the people that um, that will suffer. But um, I think, I, I can't remember exactly what it says. Yeah, I think the understanding is always the people as a whole must suffer, you know. The, yeah. You think yeah. of Isaiah, you've paid double for all your sins. You know what I mean? The idea that, they're, that the failings that led them into exile would have to sort of be expiated through. That's right. That's further. right suffering that that idea was there and jesus taking that on but i mean who else made that connection it's um it's hard not it's hard to blame peter i think and his peers for expecting from jesus what naturally expected son of david son of god that jesus was going to be the sort of powerful king who was just going to lead into victory so yeah Motion comes in a totally unexpected way. Yeah, and Jesus really seems to lambast him, you know, in a in a really powerful, someone say, very cruel uh, way. Get thee behind me, Satan! Wow, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's such a that's Peter. You know, this is Jesus' best mate. You know, I mm. mean, gosh, mm. um, mind you, I mean, it's possible. I'm not suggesting he's being tongue in cheek, but I mean, Satan in say in the book of Job, Satan has the role of uh, 
looking for dissension in the empire there, isn't he? But, you know, uh, someone, the, the idea may be that Satan's playing the role of diverting him from his proper path. You know, yeah. perhaps what, what Peter's saying is a temptation for Jesus. Um, I'm trying to think if it connects to the temptations in the wilderness, but um, the temptations in the wilderness are for power, you know, and, and for... for uh, when Jesus says, take this cup away from me, we know that, that he is tempted not to go the path, the difficult path of pain. And maybe that Peter is offering in that same temptation. Yeah. And so get behind me doesn't mean so much as get out of my sight. It means get in line, you know, line up with the agenda I have. Don't tempt me. Don't tempt me to go an easier path. Well, maybe there's something of the, you just said, you know, I don't think there's anything um, tongue in cheek in what Jesus is saying, but we never know how exactly mm. Jesus said things because the Bible very deliberately doesn't, or I think very deliberately doesn't describe it, um, you know, but we come, you know, I mean, maybe was there actually a twinkle in Jesus's eye when yeah. he said, yeah. you know, get thee behind me, Satan, know what I mean? Yeah. Um, we don't know. Uh, you know, I like to think that there was in, in, in situations like that, you know, like I like to I wonder about, you know, what how Jesus was in his manner with the Syrophoenician woman, you know, when he would say, you know, it's not fit to. Yeah. Yes, know, yes, 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 yes. Absolutely. You know, dogs and all that. Yeah. That's yeah. right. Was there a twinkle in his eyes? He said, I mean, the problem yeah. we've got is uh, I remember there was a book done on the sense of humor of Jesus. Right. Um, yeah, you because know, there are jokes. But yeah. we, lose, we lose them um, because the original Aramaic is translated into Greek, is translated into English, and both in terms of the linguistic transitions and the cultural transitions, we lose, I think, some of the humour. So when the camel goes through the eye of a needle, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a, a, a metaphor which is deliberately bizarre. <laughs> you know, I think even... The Pharisee, the tax collector, turning up at the at the uh, temp at the synagogue at the same time to pray, you know, yeah. is yeah. sounds like the opening, yeah. of a, a, a opening of a classic joke. Yeah, you know. Um, yeah. In fact, I, I've mentioned many times that uh, who was it who translated the parables of Jesus? It par translates parable as jokes, you know, because they're right. sort of the jokes of Jesus. Yeah, yeah. Of, <laughs> Some of them, particularly like that one with the Pharisee tax collector, not only has this sort of classic comedic opening scene, but it finishes with a, a comedic punchline. Well, one could see it as comedic. But, um, yeah, you're right. We don't know, and we don't know whether get behind me Satan could be equally well translated as get in line, tempter, um, or... It's, it'd be nice to know what, what Peter's reaction was, whether he just fell to his face devastated or whether he had a bit of a chuckle. It was probably somewhere in between. What we do know is that Jesus follows this up with some harsh words to the disciples as a whole. If anyone's going to come after me, he's got to deny himself. It's it's um, You save your life, you lose it. It's the one who saves, who loses their life, yeah. who finds it. Uh, these these are hard things to come to terms with, but in terms of preparing yeah. his people to move beyond their expectation of prosperity, victory, independence, freedom, all the good things, the land flowing with milk and honey, we're going to get back to. It's not going to be an easy path, and they need to embrace that. We need yeah. to embrace that. Or worse than that, you'll be carrying your cross. You know yeah. this 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 symbol of. Um, how the Russian, how the Romans controlled their um, occupied countries. It's a truly horrible symbol. Mm. Mm. I mean, it's a bit. And this like must a... have been shocking for the for the disciples um, to to be hearing this language from Jesus. Yeah, it's a bit like digging your own grave, isn't it? It's, mm. uh, yeah, I mean, again, well, it's not humour, is it? But it's it's metaphor. But it's a very harsh metaphor. Yeah. 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 What's the point? Fran is agreeing. <laughs> oh, I'm reassured. Excellent. I, you know, I'm just trying to think. You know, what's the, what's Jesus trying to get through here? He's trying to just 
help them get rid of the expectation that following him is going to be easy because it's not yeah. yeah on the contrary it's going to be really hard yeah and he's got to got to get that across and he does in a way that's that's stood for all time and in the way that that paul of course takes up um in his letters mm. where's the good news brother Made the good news, I guess, that comes at the I end. Then, son of man will come with his holy angels, and justice will come. Yeah, yeah. And some of you won't, who are standing won't face death until they've seen these great things. Well, not sure what that means exactly, but I do believe this gospel of, of uh, Matthew was published after probably the death of most of those people standing there. So I don't think. Matthew, the look, publisher, look, saw, saw this as a prediction at the end of the world. No, but it's, you know, it doesn't sound like good news. But, you know, on the on the face of it, it was said in a way that was meant to stand, that was meant to, to be seen um, and read and thought and talked about. And then, I guess, to be interpreted in the way that, you know, um, Stephen Sizer has just shown us with um, um, with what he's given us from, from Romans. Mm. You know, mm. yes, you know. Be prepared to take up your cross and be prepared to make that make that sacrifice, um, you know, and good things will come of it. Yes, and be prepared to see justice come. Yeah. And, yeah, I mean, I think however we understand that some of you will not taste death until they've seen, the point will be, you know, we can expect within a lifetime to see great things happen. So, yeah, it's it's hard. It's difficult. But there is a, a light coming at the end of that tunnel, and it will be glorious. Yeah.